All right, what's up, people? So today I'm going to tell you about the, the story of my mom's death and kind of the effect it had on me. Um, I plan on making another video on how I became an addict, that whole story. So for this one, I'm just going to talk about my mom specifically, and I'm not going to tie it into any addiction sort of stuff. But anyway, that being said, also, I'm driving, obviously, so just bear with me. Um, so I remember my mom being more the nurturer and being better on the emotional side of things. My dad, not so much, and still to this day. Um, I, ha I remember some fond memories of, you know, her reading to me before bedtime, and she would kind of take me to parks, and there's not a whole lot that I do remember. Um, it's been 23 years at this point, but the the memories that I do have, they're they're all good. I don't I don't have any negative memories. Um, but anyway, up until the point where my mom got sick, my childhood was fairly normal. Um, and I had you know I have a brother and a sister. They were both around, not necessarily living at home, but they were close by, um, you know, my dad came home from work at night, um, it was a good kind of family situation, and then when I was about 12, maybe 11, going, you know, getting closer to my 12th birthday, most of the memory's kind of fuzzy as far as timeline and all that, but my mom got sick she had a cough for about a month. She didn't go to the doctor. My family ended up making a, an appointment behind her back to get checked out. At first, it got misdiagnosed as interstitial lung disease. Um, and then I don't remember how long they thought it was that for. But then eventually they figured out it was cancer. It was breast cancer. And... So she started chemo. I remember her being sick for a while, and she, there were times where she was she was really sick. And I mean, anybody that's known anybody that's gone through cancer, chemo really takes a toll and takes a lot out of the person. So, you know, she was sick. She threw up a lot. Couldn't really eat. Lost a lot of weight. Um, it made life a little bit different. Um, you know, at that point. I was going to school and, you know, she would be at home and I don't remember how much my dad was at home taking care of her, but even if she was kind of home sick and I got home before my dad got home, you know, I was old enough that I could kind of take care of myself and help take care of my mom and that kind of thing. Um, so not much changed during most of the period that she was sick and then... I remember, so from this point on, the, like I said, my memory's not that great, but I have a few snapshots in time of, of things that happened. So, leading up to when she got really sick and finally died, I remember coming home from school one day, and she was outside hanging clothes on the clothesline to dry, and that was very unusual, and I hadn't seen her outside, um, or, and I hadn't seen her with enough energy to do something like that in a really long time. Um, looking back on it and believing what I believe now, I feel like it was the last chance that her body was going to allow her soul or her spirit, whatever word you want to use, to kind of enjoy the time left. It was like the last moments that I think she was, her body was going to allow her, her soul to, to experience her time on earth. So, um, you know, yeah, looking back on it, it kind of seems like maybe that's what was going on, but... Anyway, so there was that day she was out there doing that, um, 
and I remember feeling re- really good, like, oh, this is great, uh, maybe, sh- maybe she might get better, and this and that, um, but, went to bed that night, and I was woken up around five in the morning, I think, by paramedics, she had had a couple of seizures, you know, my dad called 911, they took her to the hospital, um, I probably went to school that day, and then at some point, you know, went to the hospital, they were figuring out what was going on, and I don't remember how long she was in the hospital for, but at a certain point, my family kind of went, my, my brother and sister, they were all older, um, my sister was probably like 21 at the time. My brother was like 28. Um, they all went off together and came out. And they were, it wasn't obvious that they were hiding anything from me, but I could tell my dad was in a different state when I saw them again. And I had a pretty good idea what was going on. But then sometime later, like, I mean, it was that same day, but. Eventually, they told me that my mom wasn't going to make it. She was going to get, she was going to be moved to a hospice uh, to make her as comfortable as she could while, as she could be while, you know, the inevitable happened. Because at that point, she was going through chemo, but the cancer had spread uh, to a lot more places than just the breast. Um, so... She was in hospice for a little while. Again, don't remember. Um, I think from the time that she was out hanging the clothes to the time that she was dead, it couldn't have been more than two or three weeks. So it it all, the end happened pretty abruptly. Um, you know, she was sick for about a year, but then when, you know, that last little part where we knew she wasn't going to make it and then she finally died was was not that long so I remember being you know at the hospice every day and she was in real bad shape she was like emaciated um probably weighed like 70 pounds I mean she wasn't that tall but still she she was skin and bones um you know and and things were, were getting bad and then there was one day where I don't remember how long exactly we knew for, but they knew that she wasn't going to make it through the night. So we were all there. And the day that she died, again, there's not much that I specifically remember, but the two, two things that I do remember, or I guess you could say three things, um, towards the very, very end, Um, she was breathing, like, her breathing was very labored, and, like, her back was arching, um, with every breath that she took, um, because it was, I mean, she was unconscious at that point, but it was, you know, it was taking her body so much effort. She was, she was, her body was having to use so much effort that, you know, it it was almost, you could almost call it, like, violent, like, her breathing was was violent because of the level of exertion that she had to uh, to use. Um, and when we knew the end was really close, I remember my dad sat me next to her and um, had me hold her hand. And um, you know. We just, I, I, I have no idea how long I was there holding her hand for, but we were basically just, you know, waiting for it to be over, and, and then it was, and we cried, and at some point we left the room, and, um, so that, you know, that part I remember how much later this was, what I'm about to tell you, I'm not exactly sure, but, so one of the stages of death is called rigor mortis, and it's, for a period of time, the body 
tenses, like the muscles and the joints will tense and stiffen up. And it happens an hour to a few hours after death and it lasts for a number of hours. You know, it's not permanent, but anyway, the reason the reason that that's relevant is because the only other thing from that day that I remember, um, you know, I had, I had kissed her on the cheek, uh, a lot while she was in the hospice, um, pretty sure I kissed her not long after she died, and then this next time that I kissed her, I don't remember, again, I don't remember how much later after her death it was, I don't remember, um, how long we were out of the room, um, why we went back, I don't remember if I was alone or not, but what I do remember vividly is leaning over to kiss her, and I did, I kissed her on the cheek, and rigor mortis had set in at that point, and the, the sensation that I got on my lips, or not a sensation, but it was like kissing somebody whose jaw was clenched, and I don't mean to get too, you know, hopefully you're not squeamish, but until this point, reality hadn't really set in, um, but God, yeah, those, those three, four, five seconds where I went and kissed her and my lips could feel the way her jaw felt, that was the moment when shit got real, basically, um, and it's one of the most vivid memories that I have for, you know, in my entire life, and it's, it wasn't, I don't really know how it made me feel, it wasn't, like, shocking, it was just real, I guess, um, and up until this point, and including this point, I hadn't really cried about it all that much. That wasn't until the funeral, when, even at the wake, um, you know, because we were, I was raised Catholic, and we had a wake with an open casket, um, and, you know, I could still see her, but there was something about being at the funeral with the casket being closed, and not being able to see her anymore, that made me cry quite a bit. And, yeah, we had the funeral, and she got buried, and life changed a whole lot after that. I'm not going to get into all that, um, because like I said, this, this is specifically about this situation, but um, if you remember, I said that she didn't go to the doctor for a while, and my family made an appointment behind her back. The hardest part about all this was um, I was angry at her for, you know, I kind of blamed her a little bit for not taking care of herself and not, you know, wanting to get herself checked out, and that was really hard to be angry at somebody who's not around to defend or explain themselves, and I kind of worked that out in my own way. Um, another big problem that, that this whole situation bestowed upon me was, um, with kind of relationships with women, I was always subconsciously seeking to, to replace her, and it, and it really screwed a lot of, uh, a lot of things up for me, and created a lot of lost opportunities, because I was kind of desperate for something that wasn't really realistic, um, and ultimately, um, you hear a lot of people say sometimes that, you know, something like this, losing a parent at that age, you don't really, you don't ever really accept it or become okay with it. You kind of learn 
to tolerate it and just, you know, live life without the person. I mean, what choice do you have? And uh, I think there's there's a lot of truth in that. It's it never really stops hurting ever, um, especially at that age. It's a really shitty age to lose to lose a parent. Um, you know, I've, I've always spent a lot of time wondering how things would be different if that never happened. Um, you know, wondering if I would have made a lot of the same mistakes that I've made and gone down some of the self-destructive paths that I've, that I've gone down. If, um, if this event never happened and I mean I don't really think that way anymore it was always kind of growing up and and learning to deal with it it was always hard not to uh, to think of it that way or to think of it in those terms but ultimately with things like these the only way you can really survive is if you're willing to to extract whatever positivity you can out of even as shitty a situation as this and um, I think having this happen at the age that it happened to me made me a lot more resilient to you know emotional trauma and it definitely changed my worldview and the things that I ponder, you know, in my free time. Um, I spent a lot of time thinking about kind of life, the universe, and everything sort of stuff because um, I told you I was raised Catholic, but I never really, I never accept anything without questioning it, so I spent a lot of time really thinking about, you know, the afterlife and the soul or spirit and where is she now and, you know, I'm not going to get into it, but like those kind of things I spent, I would spend a lot of time thinking about, um, and I mean, uh, I guess a, a lot of that is kind of neutral, but at the same time, it, it was kind of good because it, I think it turned me into more, a deeper, more introspective sort of person. I mean, I might have ended up like that anyway, but, so, yeah, I mean, if anybody, whether you've lost a parent or not, or you're, parent is sick and, you know, God forbid they're, they have a terminal illness or, you know, whatever reason it is you're watching this video. Um, if you can take one thing from it, it's that just even, I'm not glad that, that my mom died when I was 13, obviously, but you can take any situation and as shitty as it might be and even the shittiness might outweigh the the positive that you can get from it I mean it doesn't matter but just like I said in order to survive and um, persevere and just continue to grow as a person you have to be willing to to try to take shitty situations and shitty events and, like I said, extract whatever positivity you can out of it and just use your experiences as a way to grow as a person and it's what I've tried to do and yeah it's been it's been 23 years it sucks that it happened but in a lot of ways i'm 
I'm glad about the ways that it changed me. Again, I'm not glad that it happened. Um, you know, I wish I could have shared the last 23 years with, with my mother. Unfortunately, it didn't work out that way, but at least I can be glad about some of the ways that that the whole experience changed me. Um, you know, and obviously you don't know, I don't know how I would have been different exactly, just like I don't know how my life would have been different. I don't know how as a person, as an individual, internally, I would have been different, but I can see some of the effects that it had on me, and I can see that some of the ways that it affected me were positive. Um, I feel like a lot of people freak out about some insignificant sort of things and, you know, get really bent out of shape over just minor petty stuff and you know I could give a couple examples but that's one of the biggest ways that one of the biggest things that I can be thankful for um, that I got out of this experience that I wish didn't happen but it did anyways this video is plenty long at this point but there was kind of no way to uh to make it any shorter than it was, but again, I just wanted to share this, I've been wanting to share it for a while, um, I hope whether you've been through the same thing, whether you have somebody you love has a terminal illness, um, or you're just doing research, or whatever, for, for whatever reason it was that you clicked on this video, um, I hope you got something out of it, and I just, I hope that you, you learn that it's possible to turn the worst, the worst things into something positive, if you're open to it, and if you try hard enough, so... If you're still here after these 23 minutes, thanks for listening, and I'll catch you on the next one.